Letter from John Banks to Heinrich Bullinger by John Banks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Most excellent father, you will perhaps wonder that in these turbulent times I should write to you, who never before have done so, the rather as I never had any communication with you, and am now about to write of matters which would endanger my safety if these letters should be intercepted before the bearer leaves England. But I do not consider this a sufficient cause to delay what I am about to state, since it is not only right in itself that these details should be known, but especially by you, on account of your affection and kindness towards the Greys, that most noble of our families, which indeed it never hesitated to set forth. Although this family is now ruined and almost become extinct, for your blessed name of our Saviour and the sake of the Gospel— Yet those who are real Christians ought not so much to lament the ruin of that illustrious family as to rejoice that its last act was a testimony to the name of Jesus. Footnote, he refers to the execution of the Duke of Suffolk about three weeks before. End footnote. The more so, since those who rest with our Lord in the kingdom of the Father no longer are occupied in witnessing the lamentable ruin of our nation. Wretched indeed are we who daily hear contumelies heaped upon the name of the Saviour, and behold the dreadful slaughter of those who endeavoured to promote his glory and extend his kingdom. But to return to the greys of whom I intended to write to you, both on account of that great regard towards them, which is so plainly shown in your works, and for my affection towards them when dead, to whom, when living, I was anxious to show my respect. I send you some communications relative to Jane, the daughter of the Duke, truly precious, not so much for her incredible advances in learning wherein she excelled other females, although but in the seventeenth year of her age, as for the singular courage with which this youthful female surpassed men in the warfare of Christ, so that she could not be subdued by any machinations of the papists, nor deceived by their snares, as may be understood from her conference, which I send to you. This communication she had with that distinguished and crafty papist Dr. Feckenham, Upon certain controverted points of our religion, her opinion concerning which she explained with learning and ability, it is sufficiently apparent from what she declared shortly before her execution that she continued steadfast to the end in this confession of faith. I have joined it to other documents which appear to me worthy to be generally known. How her precious mind was illumined by the true light of the word of God may also be discerned from two letters, one which she wrote to her sister, the Lady Catherine, inciting her to study the sacred writings, the other to a certain apostate to call him back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have translated all these from our language into Latin that you may not consider the labor to have been wholly lost by which you endeavored to enlighten that family and excited them to the pursuit of religion. For I can be a witness, if not the fullest, still an eyewitness to the especial benefits which the whole family, particularly Jane, received from your works. She not only diligently marked all the heads of your second decade, but even committed them to memory. The Duke himself, occupied in the study of religious works, as much time as he could gain from state affairs, particularly those written by you, with the pleasing style of which he often expressed himself to be much delighted. From this study he gained considerable advantage when, during his imprisonment, some unreasonable men endeavoured to draw him from the faith and confession of the true Saviour, but they could not move him by any means. To the last breath he confessed the Lord Jesus. Although, when carried to execution, a papistical adviser, one of the swinish herd, clamoured concerning the Catholic Church, the Mass, the Fathers, and their customs confirmed by ancient usage, he would not acknowledge any other sacrifice than that which is perfected in the death of Christ. By this faith he sustained himself, and in this faith he ended his life. I would have written you farther concerning the entire subversion of religion and the anti-Christian madness now prevalent in England, but those who daily arrive from England at Zurich, that seat of good literature, can better inform you the particulars. It therefore only remains for me again and again to beseech you to accept this my expression of duty, and that you would account me among the number of your friends, and pray to God that our England may at length be freed from that popish tyranny whereby it is now oppressed. Farewell, excellent Bullinger, and whatever you do, continue to enlighten the kingdom of Christ by your writings. London, 15th March, 1554. End of letter from John Banks to Heinrich Bullinger by John Banks
Her Communication with Dr. Feckenham by Lady Jane Grey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The communication had between Lady Jane Grey and Dr. Feckenham, Abbot of Westminster. Feckenham. Madam, I lament your heavy case, and yet I doubt not, but that you bear this sorrow of yours with a constant and patient mind. Jane, you are welcome unto me, sir, if your coming be to give Christian exhortation, and as for my heavy case, I thank God I do so little lament it, that, rather, I account the same for a more manifest declaration of God's favour towards me than ever he showed me at any time before and therefore there is no cause why either you or others who bear me good will should lament or be grieved with my case being a thing so profitable for my soul's health feckenham i am here come to you at this present sent from the queen and her council to instruct you in the true doctrine of the right faith although i have so great confidence in you that i shall have i trust little need to travail with you much therein jane I heartily thank the Queen's Highness, who is not unmindful of her humble subject, and I hope likewise that you, no less, will do your duty therein, both truly and faithfully, according to that you were sent for. Feckenham. What is then required of a Christian? Jane. That he should believe in God the Father, in God the Son, and in God the Holy Ghost, three persons, one God. Feckenham. Is there nothing else to be required or looked for in a Christian but to believe in him? Jane. Yes, we must also love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and our neighbour as ourself. Feckenham. Why, then faith only justifies not or saves not? Jane. Yes, verily, faith, as Paul saith, only justifieth. Feckenham. Why, St. Paul saith, if I have all faith without love, it is nothing. Jane, true it is, for how can I love him whom I trust not, or how can I trust him whom I love not? Faith and love go both together, and that love is comprehended in faith. Feckenham, how shall we love our neighbour? Jane, to love our neighbour is to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and give drink to the thirsty, and to do to him as we would be done to. Feckenham, why, then, it is necessary unto salvation to do good works also, it is not sufficient only to believe. Jane, I deny that, and I affirm that faith only saveth, but it is meet for a Christian to do good works, in token that he follows the steps of his master, Christ. Yet may we not say that they profit to our salvation, for when we have done all, we are unprofitable servants, and faith only in Christ's blood saves us. Fakenham, how many sacraments are there? Jane, Two, the one, the sacrament of baptism, and the other, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Feckenham, no, there are seven. Jane, by what scripture find you that? Feckenham, well, we will talk of that hereafter, but what is the signification of your two sacraments? Jane, by the sacrament of baptism I am washed with water and regenerated by the Spirit, and that washing is a token to me that I am the child of God. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper offered unto me is a sure seal and testimony that I am, by the blood of Christ which he shed for me on the cross, made partaker of the everlasting kingdom. Feckenham, why, what do you receive in that sacrament? Do you not receive the very body and blood of Christ? Jane, no, surely, I do not so believe. I think that, at the supper, I neither receive flesh nor blood, but only bread and wine, which bread, when it is broken, and the wine, when it is drunken, puts me in mind how that, for my sins, the body of Christ was broken, and his blood shed on the cross, and with that bread and wine I receive the benefits that come by the breaking of his body, and shedding of his blood on the cross for my sins. Feckenham. Why does not Christ speak these words? Take, eat, this is my body. Require you plainer words, does he not say it is his body? Jane, I grant he saith so, and so he saith I am the vine, I am the door, but he is never the more for that a door, nor a vine. Does not St. Paul say, he calleth those things that are not, as though they were, Romans 4. God forbid that I should say that I eat the very natural body and blood of Christ, for then either I should pluck away my redemption, or else there were two bodies, or two Christs, or twelve bodies, when his disciples did eat his body, and it suffered not till the next day. So finally one body was tormented on the cross. 
and if they did eat another body, then had he two bodies, or if this body were eaten, then it was not broken upon the cross, or if it were broken upon the cross, it was not eaten of his disciples. Fekenham. Why is it not as possible that Christ by his power could make his body both to be eaten and broken, as to be born of a virgin, as to walk upon the sea, having a body, and other such-like miracles, as he wrought by his power only? Jane. Yes, verily, if God would have done so at his supper, any miracle, he might have done so. But I say that he minded to work no miracle, but only to break his body, and to shed his blood on the cross for our sins. But I pray you answer me to this one question. Where was Christ when he said, Take, eat, this is my body? Was he not at the table when he said so? Was he at that time alive, and suffered not till the next day? What took he but bread? What break he but bread? And what gave he but bread? Yea, what he took, that he brake, and look what he brake, he gave. Yea, and what he gave, he did eat. And yet all this while he himself was alive, and at supper before his disciples, or else they were deceived. Fackenham, you ground your faith upon such authors as say and unsay, both with a breath, and not upon the church, to whom you ought to give credit. Jane, no, I ground my faith upon God's word, and not upon the church, for if the church be a good church... The faith of the church must be tried by God's word, and not God's word by the church, nor yet my faith. Shall I believe the church because of antiquity, or shall I give credit to the church that takes away from me the one half of the Lord's Supper, and will suffer no layman to receive it in both kinds? But surely I think if they deny it us, then deny they to us part of our salvation, and I say that it is an evil church, and not the spouse of Christ, but the spouse of the devil, that alters the Lord's Supper, and both takes from it and adds to it. To that church, I say, God will add plagues, and from that church will he take their part out of the book of life. Do they learn that of St. Paul when he ministered to the Corinthians in both kinds? Shall I believe this church? God forbid. Fagenham, that was done for a good intent of the church to avoid a heresy that sprung upon it. Jane, why shall the church alter God's will and ordinance for good intent? How did King Saul? The Lord God forbid. To this... M. Feckenham gave me a long, tedious, yet eloquent reply, using many strong and logical persuasions to compel me to lean to their church, but my faith had armed my resolution to withstand any assault that words could then use against me. Of many other articles of religion we reasoned, but these formally rehearsed were the chief and most effectual. Jane Dudley After this, Feckenham took his leave, saying that he was sorry for her, for I am sure, quoth he, that we too shall never meet. True it is, said the Lady Jane, that we shall never meet, except God turn your heart, for I am assured, unless you repent and turn to God, you are in an evil case. And I pray God in the bowels of his mercy to send you his Holy Spirit, for he hath given you his great gift of utterance, if it pleased him also to open the eyes of your heart. End of Her Communication with Dr. Feckenham by Lady Jane Grey A sermon of John Ocolampadius to Young Men and Maidens by John Ocolampadius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This thing which I shall speak here to young men, which must be fed first with milk and such tender meat, I would likewise you that be elders and more ancient in Christ's doctrine to practice the same diligently, every man in his own house at home, for little it shall avail thus openly to preach unto you, unless ye use the same in your own households, the which private and domestical instruction I think so profitable and necessary in Christ's church, that without it our open sermons, though they be never so good and learned, shall little sink or remain in young men's hearts, by reason their minds and sense be so wandering and set upon trifles, rather than to mark any good thing, such things as be wholesome and for their soul's health, few of them regard, unless they be brought up from their youth in the fear of God. To you now, therefore, young men, I speak, that be christened. Your parents, whether they be alive or dead, brought you of a good and a Christian mind to be christened, that ye might be dead from this world and sin. Remember wherefore God did call you to that life, not that you should live here and heap up riches in this world, but that you should inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
the which kingdom shall be given only to them that fear God and work righteousness. If we live wickedly and continue in sin, so as the fashion of young men and maids is to do, perpetual damnation and fire everlasting shall follow, for God is a just judge. Again, if we will walk in the commandments of the Lord, we shall find joy and life everlasting in heaven with the angels and all godly saints. But if you will not cease from your sins and wickedness, but still remain and wallow in your naughtiness, look for nothing else but everlasting fire with the devil. You young persons, you be bound to be obedient to your parents in all things, save only such as pertains to God and your soulward. In all other matters, if you live not obedient to them, ye have no excuse before God, the first and principal honor must be to God, the next after to our parents. What profit is it, if thy parents do tender thee never so much, make thee their heir of all they have, and pamper up with all manner of delicates, and thou to lose the favor of God, without the which there is no health, no quietness, even as though a man for one little piece of land full of wides and briars, should forsake all the whole riches and treasure of the world. And at length the Lord shall also find these out when he shall judge the world. All you ought, for the most part, to follow the common sort of people, having no difference betwixt good and bad, and other not knowing things spiritual, or else not regarding them. First look ye be obedient to the word of God, and hearken to it daily and diligently. And if your parents do grudge therewith, or be offended, do you rather fear and regard your heavenly Father, which hath both power of body and soul, than your fleshly parents, which have no power over you, but only inwardly things, which is rather than to be esteemed God, which is rather than to be esteemed God, which is almighty, and which hath promised heaven, or your parents, here, which give you but earthly things, and such as be transitory and casual to every blast of fortune? Truly, God, I know undoubted some parents, which do all they can, that their children should not hear the word of God, O fowls and perverse people, unworthy to be named Christian men. Man must needs here in this world have some God to serve, either the God of heaven or else the devil, the great adversary of mankind. It must needs follow, for so saith Christ, that no man can serve two lords at once. They which will not serve God do serve the devil, and be all the ministers of the devil which do not lead a Christian life. And for this cause, Christian men's children, when they be christened, be told to abrenounce all the works of the devil, and so they promise, hereafter, if they live, to lead a Christian life, to follow whatsoever Christ commandeth, to eschew whatsoever God forbiddeth. And this vow pleaseth God right well. Perjured and forsworn you be, if ye break your vow. Say not now, I made no promise at my baptism. Thy parents and thy godfathers promised in thy behalf whom also here I charge and warn, that this vow be performed and discharged. It hath been taken for an high matter of godliness, if a young man had vowed himself into some monastery, there to remain in service of God and perpetual poverty. But unless they had been enticed in with promises and fair flattery words, they would never have consented to that wicked madness to bind themselves in abbeys, whereas was nothing less than the service of God exercised. Now, for the most part of you, ought they neither know what God, what the devil, what good or what evil means. Neither is God nor the devil any such thing as the painters make them. If you know how merciful God is, how good, how meek, how gentle, how suffering, how patient and just he is, then you know God, for by these properties we learn what God is. Contrarywise, the devil is nothing else but unmercifulness, hatred, envy, murder, lying, mocking of our neighbor, and all thing that is naught. Furthermore, they be the children of God which follow God in virtue, in innocency, mercy, pity, and unfeigned charity. Again, they be the children of the devil, which be lying, cruel, unmerciful, disobedient to their parents, perjured. They which be obedient to God do all such as please God. They that serve the devil do that please him. Wilt thou now serve God, then set thine eyes of thy mind, and mark Christ, be just, gentle, meek, true, faithful. Thou hast abrenounced all the works of the devil in thy baptism. Now what be the works of the devil, I shall briefly declare. To backbite and speak ill of men, to mock, to despise, to scoff at widows and aged men, to give no reverence to thy parents, and chiefly to neglect the word of God, and to blaspheme his name, Worldly men love to go pompously arrayed, 
with their hose jagged, the play, and make merry as though they should evermore live and never perish. They riot and revel, they use most impudent dances, they go up and down from one street to another all the night long with their crying and routing, they take away from aged men and infirm persons their natural rest and quietness, their little regard, their parents' commandments, whatsoever they speak unto them, they make light and mock at it. Yea, and that is worse, the greater fort of them cannot say the Lord's Prayer right, and if they can say the words, the strength and spirit thereof they have not. They babble up their prayers as the nuns were wont to do their psalter. But such young men as serve and add yet themselves to Christ be not polluted with such manner of wickedness. Then such lewd and wicked persons which lead their time so abominably, let them nothing hinder you in your virtuous doings whether they be priests or laymen, or whatsoever they be, for the pomp and pride of this world, yet never pleased God, nor never shall. And yet it is plain such things do greatly delight and stir up young men, such as have not yet learnt to follow reason, nor consider the end and death of man. Yet is nothing else all this but vanity, to pass time to sport, to drink, to fight, to set idle, to solace, O Lord, how pitiful is our youth brought up, even from their child age! Wherefore, when they come to be men afterward, their fruits appear thereafter. In like as our first parents in paradise, a place of all pleasure, were forbid from the apple, that, above all things, they should beware and be circumspected therein. But after that, through the devil's instigation they had committed in taking of the apple, they fell into all manner of miseries, wherewith we be all now oppressed to this day. Even so, likewise, it is now amongst youth, which supposeth the glory of this world to be nothing else but all pleasure and delight and altogether honey, when indeed it is bitter poison and verily everlasting damnation. I do not here speak against honest mirth and such manner of exercise of the body as be comely, but because I perceive the devil thus to go about with such delights and baits to snare young men and maids, and so to seduce them from all goodness, if they will consent unto him, that... At length he maketh them clean desperate, both without all fear of God and all shamefacedness, which is the only ornament of all young age, in so much that neither they regard God, neither truth, nor justice, goodness, nor honesty, nor no other virtue whereof also proceedeth their greater destruction, that they will not hearken to the word of God, nor to be brought unto it by their parents. O oh, you parents, little do you know what a charge lieth upon your backs, and you children, when will you remember and consider what it is you promised to God in your baptism? It is not to be neglected, I tell you, that you vow and promise unto God. He requireth our faith, and such unfaithful false covenant breakers he will punish, and that most sharply. The Lord setteth before us two ways, the one to life, the other to destruction. Mark now well, ye children of the Lord, the one is sharp, thorny, and full of briars, which few men do walk, but after that it be entered once, it is very plain and pleasant, and bringeth to everlasting life. The other seemeth first delectable, as though it should conduct us to all manner of goodness, but at length and last end it casteth us headlong down to hell, where the devil and his angels be kept fast abiding the day and judgment of God. Therefore, saith Christ, Matthew 7, enter in by the straight wicket, for broad is the way that leadeth to perdition, and large is the door, and many enter in thereat. And again, straight is the door, and the way narrow, which leadeth into heaven, and few there be that find it. The life of all true Christians followeth this straight way, in the which way they be daily exercised and turmoiled in perturbations of this world. And they never cease nor rest, till they have finished their course, and come where they would be. Say some, then shall I not keep company with my fellows and acquaintance, shall I not make merry with my gossips and solace with the ones, or... Twist a wick. I am no monk, nor friar. What man is able to keep so straight a rule? You must consider we be men. What would you we should do? Here is my counsel, good son, what thou shalt do. For I know that the world is wont to object and say, Here, I say, and obey the word of God. And undoubted thou shalt soon perceive this straight way, now to thy seeing, shortly to be easy and pleasant. And I do not doubt, but at length thou shalt give me a great thanks for my counsel, which have kept thee from such destruction and jeopardy. I would wish to all you young men and children the eyes of your mind open, 
that ye might see the end that such men come to. One is slain, being drunk and mad. Another hath his arm or leg stroke off. Another goeth a robbing and fight wrongfully for other men's money, and so struck and down and slain like a beast. Another is hanged for a small trifle. And who can recite up all the kinds of death and destruction that such disobedient persons as these come unto? What need we any example to be brought, when daily experience declareth what end and mischief these wretches come to? And the same I speak also to young women and maids. They be wanton and incontinent. They have and draw to such fellows after their own sort more lecherous than any goat. They scoff and mock every young man that cometh to them. They delight most in bawdy songs. Some labor and bringeth forth privily, and so they turn other to be common stews, or else be driven to extreme poverty, and so live in contempt and misery all their life long. What honest young man would be coupled or content to be joined in marriage with such a beast? Then what cost of apparel have they, the most base and beggarly women which have right naught, yet how sumptuously they must go arrayed? Amongst the very Gentiles a man shall not find more excess and pride in vesture. Wherefore learn betime you Christian younglings to fear the Lord God, and with whole heart and mind hearken to the word of him every morning, the first thing ye do, and every Sunday, and let it nothing perturb you, though ye be grudged or condemned therefore for the service of God, for this it is that pleaseth God most highly. It is no matter whether we live or die to the Lord, that is enough for us, what should pass for more? And think this rather, and study how you may follow him. And care not for this vain sort of men, this rascal rabble of ruffians, which can nothing else but eat and play, and... Here there is a lacuna in the text. The streets to be seen of other. And the same I speak to young maids likewise, if God send us long life here, and we spend it in wantonness, in the world to come we shall be cast into perpetual fire. Jeremiah, in his Lamentations, chapter 3, saith, It is good for a man if he bear his yoke in his youth, and good it is for a man if he teach his soul in his youth to bear the yoke of God's commandments. If we will be content to serve God, then shall the sea and tempest of our nations soon swage, for the Lord will never forsake us. They which be elder men, and have received light of God in his gospel, know what I say, and greatly complain their misery and ignorance in which they have been brought up and led. Oh, say they, if we had had such knowledge in the scripture which we now hear, thanks be to God, we would never have run in the anger of God as we have. Young age may be well compared to tender grafts or buds, apt to be bended which way you will, if ye take them in time and and while they be tender, but if they be onscroven and passed in bigness, it is but a lost labor. Whatsoever ye do, break them, you shall sooner than bend them, after they be come to their nature. The same thing we see likewise in brute beasts. Take me a lion, and bring him up amongst men, he will be tame. And like it is with children, ill education and bringing up maketh much in marring a man. Filthy words and bawdy talk is a great token of a corrupt heart. You must take better heed than you have done yet, what company your children keep, what communication they use, and this shall make you Christian people. Children be as much consecrated to God as though they were anointed priests, or shaven into any order of religion. Consider groundly with thyself and tremble, if thou be in the anger of God. Canst thou sleep quietly or take any rest? It will vex an honest man if his neighbor bear him displeasure, and a gentle child, if he sees his father sore angered with him. He cannot tell what to do to avoid his displeasure with flattering, with weeping. He assayeth all ways he can to be reconciled again unto his father. Then how much more ought we to prove all means we may to be reconciled to our heavenly father, whom we have offended so oft every hour, which hath both given us our body and soul? They be but trifles that our fathers bestow upon us in comparison to them that we receive of God. The Lord our Father once plagued the earth with the flood of waters, only reserving eight persons whom he preserved from the waters through his mere grace only. Sodom and Gomorrah with many cities more he destroyed with fire, besides what an infinite number of men hath been slain in battle. Who will not fear this Lord? He is slow to anger. He granteth us time to repent, years sufficient. He sendeth his prophets before to admonish us of his anger to come. Then, if we take no heed by his admonishments, his vengeance will strike when we least think of it. 
we know no end of our life. Death creepeth every day while we be most in our rough and daily in our pastimes. No man hath a commission of his life how long to live. Then why obey we not the precepts of God and cease from our sins which slay the soul? Many deceive themselves when they sin secretly, supposing that God doth not behold them. If thou shouldst walk in a desert or in the most dark wood where no man could come to thee nor see thee, yet God would see thy works. Take heed of his vengeance which is so sharp, for we be ready to offences diverse wherewith we greatly provoke the anger of God. Work ye the deeds that please God, for these two go always together, to cease from sin and to work charity. If we cease not from sin, we cannot work no goodness that pleaseth God. Let us demand our children thus. What faith professest thou? Dost thou profess that faith which the apostolic church hath left? Tell me the articles of thy faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, etc., let young men be learnt this creed perfectly, and let them say it not with their mouth, but have it in their hearts, that they may set all their trust upon God their Maker, that both he will and also is able to defend them. This it meaneth, Almighty God is the Maker of all things, of heaven, of earth, of things visible and things invisible. All things that be have their being of God, for without him nothing is made. Corn, wine, oil, wool and all things else, yea, the angels of heaven, all come of God. Here we must consider that all these things were created for us. Oh, what a merciful Father is this, which hath ordained such things for us so unworthy wretches! What will he not grant us hereafter? What will he deny now to his children? Unto elder men and such as be more grown in their faith, the mystery of the Trinity must be declared, so much as man's weakness may comprehend. There is one God, which made all things, both that are in heaven and that are in earth. If thou dost trust in God, thou mayest be sure the devil cannot hurt ye, much less no mortal creature. To believe in God is to have a constant trust in God, and to drive all thine hope in him, all other things and creatures set apart, and that shall cause us to love God truly, other else it is but a feigned and hypocritical love. It followeth in the creed, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, all mankind was damned utterly for their great and manifold offences, but Christ hath borne upon his back all our sins, satisfying his Father for us, and delivering us from everlasting death, that now we should live to our Master Christ. Whosoever doth inwardly believe this will conform his life honestly according to the commandments of God, eschewing all manner of vice so much as in him lieth. There is nothing more abhorrent amongst true Christian men than sin. Almighty God first made Adam and Eve our first janitors and put them in paradise, giving them an easy commandment which they transgressed, deceived through the subtlety of the devil, whereof we all take our offspring. Ye you know what they did and what happened to them, the same infection now is gendered in us. What man doth not see this and prove it daily in himself, but chiefly in children, as we may see, this more appeareth by little and little, for they begin to lie, to steal, to be light, to stand checkmeet with their parents, nothing regarding God, whatsoever is spoken. If we see any such vices springing up in them, we must reform them in time, with rods and stripes, lest the evil inveil and get the head, so that the whole man shall be poisoned with the venom thereof. And so they procure to themselves everlasting damnation, unless they redress themselves by time, and withstand such infections while they be fresh and grind. There is no young man, such a babe, how young soever he be, but he can understand what is good and what is evil. For this is the law of nature written in all men's hearts. Do to others as thou wouldst be done to thyself. Let us intermit nothing in them which become to a more perfect reason and understanding, that they give not themselves to the devil. Here I admonish all children that if you see your parents slack in hearing the word of God, follow not their steps, nor be like them. All persons shall render account to the Lord, and every man shall answer for himself. Desire to go and hear sermons often, and the Lord shall give you plentiful grace to know him, and shall open you a way to all virtues. The Lord shall preserve you from all them that contemn his holy word. Wherefore did Christ die to deliver us from everlasting death? The exceeding great charity of God did not spare his only begotten Son, but for us all did bestow him unto the most cruel death that whosoever doth believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
Therefore, let us love him again and accordingly honor him for such benefits as he most righteously doth deserve. What greater love can there be, my dear beloved children? If thou shouldst fall in a deep pit of water and a stranger coming by draweth thee out, or if thou shouldst lie sore sick at the point of death, that no man should see any recovery in thee, there cometh a physician and restoreth thee to health, thou couldst not show no like kindness again corresponded to such pleasures done to thee. Much greater pleasures have we received of Christ, which hath plucked us out of the mouth of the devil, delivering us from hell, and promised everlasting life and joy with the angels. O dear child, say thus in thy mind, I will never sin more, seeing that sin is such a foul and abominable thing. Yea, and if I were constrained to sin with a thousand deaths, yet will I not consent thereto. Christ was the Son of God before heaven and earth was made, which, at the time appointed of the Father, was made man without any infection of sin, and lived with us in earth and at last suffered for the sins of all the world. Learn, my children, patience. Christ did bear his cross upon his own back, was knocked and scoffed, was scourged and was crowned with thorns. Mortify your members in time, lest the evil grow inward and at length break forth to your great peril and danger. It followeth in the creed, the third day he rose again from death, ascended up, etc. Bear this, you children and elders also, I do not mumble up these words without intelligence. They be golden words, and worthy to be written in all men's hearts with the finger of God. Christ is risen again from death, and so shall we. Dost thou doubt that thy body shall rise again? Christ saith it, which cannot lie. He sitteth on the right hand of the Father, from thence he shall come to revenge the wicked, and to reward the godly with heaven. All things are given him in his hand of the Father. And though we yet here remain in earth, weak and brittle vessels, yet do we tarry and look for joys to come, promised us by Christ. And to whom did he promise this? To such as, once knowing the truth, be content to lead a virtuous and an honest life, as to suffer in this present world much adversity, for whosoever intend to live godly in Christ Jesus must needs suffer persecution. Insomuch the Lord hath so premonished us, let us be content, whatsoever happen, whatsoever adversity we suffer for the glorifying of his name. And if thou were in service with some mighty lord or prince, it could not be chosen, but thou shouldst abide many perils, take much pains, sustain great cold, for the obtaining and increasing of thy living. Then rather sustain you the service of thy lord God, and doubt not of thy reward, for he himself hath promised to reward that in his endless kingdom. I believe in the Holy Ghost, etc., which did teach, and now doth teach all the faithful, the truth that Christ preached unto us. The operation of him is to make us despise the world with all his concupiscence. Younglings, here I admonish you, whensoever any ill thoughts tarry long in your minds, be you certain it is the devil that hath stirred up the fire. Cast him out through prayer and alms deeds. The good spirit doth engender in us the remembrance of eternal things, and that be good. And let not the thing that is good dwell in a corrupt place. If we be slack and negligent now that we be called of our merciful Father to his heavenly feast, he doth but well and worthily. If he call back again his grace, so gently of his mere tenderness offered unto us. Truly we be well worthy of many scourgings and beatings if we return again to our old vices after we have received and known the grace. Your going is much unseeable, your jagged and cut apparel so dashing about you. Do you declare a mad and a foolish mind? You be proud and puffed up, you give no reverence to your elders. The Holy Ghost did not teach you this, why do you neglect his inspiration? Fight against Satan with all his pomp, and that with continual prayers. Resist the vices which grow in you. Good children, learn to pray gladly our Lord's Prayer. So shall you prove to good men, and shall be both worship to the commonwealth and an ornament to Christ's religion. Flee from such company whose mind is all set to do mischief. These be wicked persons, which go about all they can to oppress the verity by their manners, their counsels, and life. Howbeit, they be not able to avert, although they somewhat obscure it, but only in their own hearts, which delights in lies. God is merciful and very gentle, therefore call upon him in Christ's name, and despise not the grace of God, after the fashion of some young men to foolish and light, which ill provide for themselves both here and in the world to come. But these flowers and life of theirs will soon fade, and then shall they perceive and forethink in their minds what they have done. I believe that Catholic Church, etc.
There is but one faith of all that ever have been, both prophets and apostles, and this universal church is not contained in one place here, but in all places of the world Christ's church is dispersed. Be you not deceived, so to think Christ's church only to be which is governed under the wicked Pope. The Lord hath his people in every place. The true church is that which hath the word of God, the Old and New Testament, which hath her sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's bread. If anything be taught thee against the right doctrine of the gospel by any man, how holy soever he be, be it to thee accursed. If the papists do teach the true honor, worship, and dignity of Christ, follow and embrace that doctrine. But else if they teach any other thing, that is, their own dreams and traditions, avoid it quickly, lest you be defiled with the leaven thereof. And be not quick in believing them that say, Our forefathers, the bishops, with all the general councils, gathered together in the Holy Ghost, have appointed this though it be directly against the word of God. Therefore, you must believe it under pain of eternal damnation. Let them avaunt with their baggage and fantasies, wherewith they have infected and deluded all the world so long. Let the youth learn the word of God exactly, so shall they easily judge of the faith and word of God, and shall not lightly swerve from God's right doctrine. The sheep of Christ hear and perceive his voice, and follow him whithersoever he goeth. The forgiveness of sins, etc., some heretics there have been, which have denied forgiveness of sins, and have invented, I cannot tell what pestilent doctrine, out of their own heads. Also let these avoid with their errors. Christ calleth sinners to him daily. Amendment of life is preached to all men, for them to obtain forgiveness of their sins. Trouble not yourselves about auricular confession. To the Lord confess your sins every day, and how are the which he only forgiveth himself. You fathers have respect and regard of your servants and maids, that they run not all the year long in their filthiness without fear of God. And so doing, you shall be lightly allowed of God. Let them learn sermons early out of the word of God, whereby they shall learn to know God, which is the beginning of an honest life. Forgive you all envy and all hatred, and your Father in heaven shall forgive your offenses. We have remission of sins, where? In the cross, when, as Christ suffered for all our sins, that is, the sins of all the world, Think ye not their sins to be pardoned, which live in all wickedness and filthiness. God forbid that we should say such men believe in Christ, that have their hearts full of filthiness, and replenished with all mischief. And let no man think it much, though he suffer here some kind of cross in this world for the justice and glory of God. We have a promise of raising of our flesh, whereof the faithful man nothing doubteth, but is sure that there is another life after this much better and joyful. This is our faith, which is taught us from our youth, which all Christian men do profess. Neither do we teach any other, whatsoever papists babble of us. If this faith be lively in us, it will bring forth fruits accordingly. What doth baptism make? It cleanseth us in this manner from sins. And like as the water purgeth the body, so doth the word of God purge the soul. Let us abhor and renounce our filthy and sinful life, if we be Christian men indeed as we profess. Howbeit... Yet the appetite and proneness to sin remaineth in us still, the which, if we trust in the Lord, is pardoned and taken away through grace. Our prayer with all desire, that the glory of our Lord may go forward, and that his kingdom daily may be enlarged unto all the ends of the earth, will they nil these wicked papists. Let our supplication and prayer be to God after his will and pleasure, which standeth ever and profitable to usward. Say, O most holy Father, help our infirmities. Forgive our manifold offences, give us right faith, that we may be appliant to all good works, which your will requireth. Deliver us from evil, that is from the devil, that he have no power nor impery upon us. Exercise yourselves much in the Lord's Prayer. Put away the books of your wicked prayers, whereof all the world is full. And be not like the hypocrites, which have a great pleasure to brag their prayers before other men, which also stand in every corner of the streets, that they may be seen of all men. But these have their reward already. Let them look for none of God. Matthew 6. It is time, I think, now to draw to a conclusion, seeing the hour is full up. I beseech and desire you fathers by our Lord Jesus Christ that you give good Christian example in your houses to your children and servants. Prove you examine well your hearts coming to receive the sacraments. If you find this in yourselves that ye you can be content to lead a Christian life hereafter, ye may boldly come, if not, away, lest ye be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Or if you do purpose, as you be wont to do after the feast of Easter, to run from town to town like madmen to fall again to your old conditions, banqueting with your whores and with your harlots, I do you to wit to receive it to your damnation. 
thou that art a father instantly call upon thy son or thy servant, that he come not hither to dishonest the board of the Lord, or to receive to him his own judgment, as Paul speaketh. It is not one day's business, all our lifetime we ought to employ this matter. We will not, after the papists' manner, our guests come to this Christian feast. Let the papists go with their errors. It is no light thing to receive the body and blood of our Lord. Here lieth the weight of all the matter, that we should hereafter lead a new life, forsaking our old sinful nature. Let all things spring of a faith unfeigned, so all shall be well both here and in the world to come. We shall both please men and all the angels above, for they do greatly embrace such as these, adore God sincerely, if we would follow this rule of charity that we would love our neighbor as ourselves and pray for all our enemies, then would God have great delight in us. Neither let us think the Christian life consisteth in words only, but in works and deeds. Other else do we nothing but slander the name of Christ among infidels. The Lord lighten all our minds with his grace, that we may do all things to his glory, and to the edifying of his Catholic Church. So be it. End of a sermon of John Ocalampadios to Young Men and Maidens by John Ocalampadios. Dr. Wycliffe's Letter of Excuse to Pope Urban the Sixth by John Wycliffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have joyfully to tell all true men the belief that I hold, and always to the Pope. For I suppose that if my faith be rightful and given of God, the Pope will gladly conserve it, and if my faith be error, the Pope will wisely amend it. I suppose over this that the gospel of Christ be part of the body of God's law, for I believe that Jesus Christ that gave in his own person this gospel is very God and very man, and by this it passes all other laws. I suppose over this that the Pope be most obliged to the keeping of the gospel among all men that live here. For the Pope is the highest vicar that Christ has here in earth. For greatness of Christ's vicars is not measured by worldly greatness, but by this, that this vicar follows more Christ by virtuous living, for thus teaches the gospel. That this is the sentence of Christ and of his gospel I take as belief, that Christ, for time that he walked here, was most poor man of all, both in spirit and in possessions, for Christ says that he had naught for to rest his head on. And over this I take as belief that no man should follow the Pope nor saint that is now in heaven, but inasmuch as he followed Christ. For James and John erred, and Peter and Paul sinned. Of this I take as wholesome counsel that the Pope leave his worldly worship to worldly lords, as Christ gave him, and move speedily all his clerks to do so. For thus did Christ, and taught thus his disciples, till the fiend had blinded this world. And if I err in this sentence, I will meekly be amended." if by the death, if it be skilful, for that I hope were good to me. And if I might travel in my own person, I would with God's will go to the Pope. But Christ has needed me to the contrary, and taught me more obedience to God than to man. And I suppose our Pope, that he will not be antichrist and reverse Christ in this working to the contrary of Christ's will. For if he summons against reason by him or any of his and pursue this unskilful summoning, he is an open antichrist and merciful intent excused not Peter, that Christ called him Satan. So blind intent and wicked counsel excuses not the Pope here, if he ask of true priests that they travel more than they may. It is not excused by reason of God that he is not Antichrist. For our belief teaches us that our blessed God suffer us not to be tempted more than we may. How should a man ask such service? And therefore pray we to God for our Pope Urban the Sixth that his holy intent be not quenched by his enemies. And Christ, that may not lie, says that the enemies of a man are especially his own family, and this is truth of men and fiends. End of Dr. Wycliffe's Letter of Excuse to Pope Urban the Sixth by John Wycliffe A Letter to the People of Edinburgh by John Knox this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To his loving brethren, whom God once gloriously gathered in the Church of Edinburgh, 
and now are dispersed for the trial of our faith, etc. The troubles of the just shall shortly come to an end to the glory of God and to their eternal comfort. Beloved brethren in the Lord Jesus, partakers now of his afflictions, if the inability of body would suffer, I would write a long letter, but being in that state that I may not write with my own hand two lines, I must abide the good leisure of God, and desire you to have me excused that I have not sooner visited you in this your dolorous persecution. When I call to mind the fearful threatenings of God that have been oftentimes thundered out into your ears, and do consider these present days in the midst of my dolor, I praise my God that Satan hath not gotten the full victory as he pretended. For this separation which now is made to the grief of many hearts is yet a severe document that the word of God hath not lost the whole strength in you, but that God, working thereby, hath pulled you forth from the midst of the wicked, lest that you should be with them condemned who now most manifestly rebel both against God and man. Of one thing I must put you in mind, and I pray God that you may fruitfully remember it that the word of God preached by the mouth of man is not a vain sound and words spoken without a purpose, but is the summoning of God himself for warning men before the judgment come. Ye have heard it plainly spoken that we would to Egypt again in despite of Jeremiah and all admonitions, which threatening for that time was not only mocked, but also boldly spoken against. But whether this day declareth the truth of that and other threatenings, let the very blind world judge. For what can be to return to Egypt, if to join hands with idolaters be not? Yea, to erect an authority by God justly condemned, without order both against God and man. Such men, when they were spoken unto, and were plainly admonished of their appearing defection, could not abide to be called proud contemners of God, who now spare not every moment to blaspheme God, and by their wicked works plainly deny that there is a God who makes difference betwixt vice and virtue. Rejoice, therefore, and praise God's mercies, who hath called you from the company of such, and continue constant in that which God of his mercy hath wrought in you, namely a fear to remain in the faction of the wicked, which fear, I pray God, may daily increase in your hearts. I know the assaults that you shall suffer are sore and hard to be gainstood, and therefore be you fervent in prayer, that ye repent not that God hath chosen you to suffer affliction with his Son Jesus Christ." Hard it is, I say, to gain stand flesh and blood, and whatsoever is most precious in this life only, in hope of that kingdom promised. And yet only they that continue to the end shall stand in assurance before the Lord Jesus, in that general day when virtue shall receive a just reward, and vice with the workers of impiety shall suffer wrath and vengeance without end. Be not ye slandered at the multitude of them that have joined hands with impiety. For if they had been of us, as St. John saith, they had remained with us. But now this their defection doth plainly declare, that when they were with us they were but as corrupted humours within the body, which behoved to be expelled forth before the body could convalesce and come to perfection again. Lament their fall, but follow not their ways, for howsoever they prosper in their attempt, the end thereof shall be their destruction, temporal and eternal, unless speedy repentance prevent God's judgments, which to wish is godly, but to believe is foolish presumption, as oftentimes ye have heard. Look not for final victory before that the strength and pride of the flesh be beaten down, neither be ye discouraged, albeit that iniquity prosper before the world. For the time of their felicity which troubleth you for the present shall be short. Join not with them, therefore, as ye will avoid plagues present and condemnation eternal. Be faithful and loving one to another, let bitterness and suspicion be far out of your hearts, and let every one watch for the preservation of another, without grudging or murmuring, being assured that, as God hath appointed you to suffer affliction for righteousness' sake, so hath he appointed you to possess a kingdom wherein neither Satan, sin, nor death shall have power to molest you. Rejoice in the Lord that he hath counted you worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Pray for me, brethren, that I may fight my battle lawfully to the end. The Lord Jesus preserve you now and ever. Amen. At St. Andrews, the 17th of July, 1571. Your brother to power in Christ Jesus. John Knox. If I might write, I would exhort you to remember that by many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. End of A Letter to the People of Edinburgh by John Knox.
that rebaptization or baptizing again is not of God and that there is but one baptism by Henry Bullinger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three most fruitful dialogues treating upon the baptism of children, very necessary to be read of all Christians in these most perilous times. Simon the Anabaptist, Joida the True Christian. That rebaptization or baptizing again is not of God, and that there is but one baptism. Simon. I have tarried here for thee more than an whole hour, Joida. I was almost persuaded, I did almost believe, that thou durst not come because that thou hadst little trust and confidence in the other articles. Joida, there is no article that I am so sure of. It is so far that I should be afraid to speak of it. Simon, but I will prove that rebaptization is of God. Joida, by what scriptures? Simon. By the nineteenth chapter of the Acts, where it is expressly set forth that the twelve men that had been baptized by John, or in the baptism of John, were baptized again by Paul in the name of Christ. If it was lawful after the baptism of John to receive the baptism of Christ, why should it not be more lawful that the baptism of the Bishop of Rome should give place unto the baptism of Christ? For as those men of Ephesus had been ignorantly and unwittingly baptized with the baptism of John, and again were baptized by Paul... In like manner, we were ignorantly baptized with the baptism of the Bishop of Rome. Ergo, we may lawfully be baptized again with the baptism of Christ. Joida. As many words as thou hast spoken, so many errors hast thou vomited and spewed out. First thou sayest that those men of Ephesus were twice baptized, which thing thou canst not prove, for the baptism of John ought not here to be taken for water, but for the doctrine. Simon. This is the only refuge that ye flee to, when ye be overcome by the truth, but ye cannot prove nor strengthen these your sayings with the scriptures, nor by any truth. Joida, but I will prove unto ye that baptism is not always taken for the washing that is done in the water, but rather for the doctrine. John chapter 1 and 3. And of this thing there be most sure tokens, signs, notes, as in Matthew, the 21st chapter, where Christ asketh the Pharisees, whether the baptism of John was of God or of men, and since that it was of God, why did they not credit and believe him, understanding by baptism, as it most manifestly appeareth, the doctrine or testimony which they ought to have believed? Simon. Well, go to, put the case that in this place it is taken for the doctrine, yet notwithstanding it followeth not that in the Acts of the Apostles it should be taken for doctrine. Joida. In the mean season... Ye were too much overseen in this thing, and overblinded, saying most shamefully, that we did affirm without any truth, the baptism is oftentimes taken for the doctrine, but go to, we will also prove, the baptism is taken in the Acts for the doctrine. In the twelfth of Acts, Luke saith, that a certain Jew called Apollos, being an eloquent man and taught in the way of the Lord, did come to Ephesus, and he did teach diligently those things that were the Lord's, knowing only the baptism of John. Here the very blind may see that Luke did speak not of the water but of the doctrine. The same Apollos did teach and instruct these twelve men in the way of the Lord, whom afterwards Paul doth ask whether after that they had believed and given credit unto the doctrine they had been pacified in their hearts and consciences by the Holy Ghost. Here it is to be noted that faith is not taken for that heavenly gift that illuminated the heart inwardly, but for the doctrine of faith which one man doth receive of another by hearing. But they did so answer that Paul might easily gather by their answer that they knew not what the peace of consciences nor what the Holy Ghost was. He, marvelling therefore what manner of doctrine this was that had not set forth unto them so necessary and principal points, did ask them whereunto they were baptized, not wherein. For he knew right well that men are baptized in water. But he asketh whereunto they were baptized, that is to say, initiated and taught, what at length was the mark that they did shoot at, fithens that they knew not the Holy Ghost. They made him answer that they were baptized, that is to say, initiated in the doctrine of John. The apostle did understand and perceive that they were not yet right well taught and instructed in the doctrine of John. He beginneth, therefore, and with express words, setteth forth the doctrine of John, which words, if they were well weighed and pondered, they make altogether against you, for thus are the words of Paul, Ioannis baptizo and baptismo poenitentiae, that is to say, John has baptized with the baptism of repentance, 
What mean these words, he hath baptized with the baptism of repentance, but that John did preach repentance, or did teach how we ought to repent, that will be initiated in Christ, or receive the first instruction in the religion of Christ. Afterwards he did speak of him that should come after him, that they might believe in him, that is to say, in Jesus Christ, out of the which faith and belief, peace, doth spring in the mind and conscience of men. Romans 5th chapter. When they had understood that, they did receive the baptism of water in the name of Jesus. The words that follow the imposition of hands make me to expound this last of the baptism of water. As I think now, I have sufficiently proved that this place helpeth nothing the Anabaptists, for they whom mention is made of in the nineteenth chapter of Acts were not baptized again, but baptized once for all, and twice instructed and taught. Simon, by this it should follow that the baptism of John and the baptism of Christ is all one, and that there is no difference between them. This cannot be, for the doctrine of John did differ from the doctrine of Christ. Joida, in this thing ye are greatly deceived, for the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ are all one, and their baptism all one. Here I do speak of the baptism of water, and by this we do gather and conclude truly that these men of Ephesus were not baptized with the baptism of John. I speak of the water, for if they had been baptized with the baptism of John, it had not been necessary and needful that Paul should have baptized them again in the baptism of Christ, for both their doctrine and their baptism are all one. Simon if the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ were all one, why did Luke write that Apollos was taught only in the doctrine or baptism of John, and that therefore Priscilla and Aquila did take him unto them, and did teach him more exactly in the way of the Lord? If the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ were all one, what did need to teach him more exactly? For he that did know the doctrine of John did also know the doctrine of Christ. Joida, Luke saith that they did expound unto him more exactly in the way of the Lord, the doctrine was all one, but in Apollos there wanted somewhat, which knew not all things exactly and perfectly, for these twelve do say also that they were taught and instructed in the baptism of John, whose doctrine, for all that, they understood not perfectly, although they were instructed in the doctrine of John, yet notwithstanding are they taught more exactly by Paul. Simon, but Paul saith not that the doctrine is all one. Joida, Thou dost every foot bring darkness into the manifest light. Tell me, I pray thee, which is the sum of Christ's doctrine and of the apostles? Simon, and I do ask that whether Paul in the nineteenth chapter of the Acts did teach that John's and Christ's doctrine were all one. Joida, to that will I answer, after that I have heard of thee, which is the sum of Christ's doctrine and of his apostles. Simon, I will not give the overhand, but persist and abide in the words of Luke, which are written, Acts 19th chapter. Joida, thou dost persist and abide in thy contention and obstinacy, and this are ye wont to do, either when ye have nothing to answer, or when ye perceive that ye are overcome with the truth. Go to, I will declare what is the sum of the doctrine of Christ and of the apostles. Mark, first chapter, it is written after this manner, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Matthew, fourth chapter, Jesus departed into Galilee, and did begin to preach, and say, Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ doth also send his apostles, saying, As my Father hath sent me, so I do send you. John, twentieth chapter, but the Father did send Christ to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins, ergo, Christ sendeth his apostles to preach the same. This is manifest and plain in the twenty-fourth of Luke and last of Mark. So it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from death upon the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached among all nations in his name, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye shall be witnesses of these things. The book of the Acts doth testify that the apostles did preach the same, second and third chapter. Hast thou anything against so manifest scriptures? Simon, nothing, but I ask whether the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ be all one. Joeda, I do prove and conclude by the places afore alleged that it is all one. It is said that the sum of the doctrine of Christ and the apostles is comprehended in this one thing, that men should repent, know the kingdom of God to be at hand, and believe in Jesus Christ. Dost thou grant these things? Simon, what then? Joida, John did teach the self-same thing, ergo their doctrine was all one. I prove the first proposition by the third of Matthew. John Baptist did preach in the desert of Jewry, and did say, Repent ye, the kingdom of God is at hand. In like manner, Luke, first chapter, and thou, child, etc. It is manifest by the first and third of John that John Baptist did preach the gospel. 
Acts 19, which place we have treated upon already, he preacheth the same, as we may gather by the words of Paul. For he speaketh there after this manner, John did preach the baptism of repentance, speaking of Jesus Christ, in whom they should believe. Here I do beseech thee to confess and tell plainly whether these things do not sufficiently prove that the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ be all one. Simon, what dost thou gather and conclude thereupon? Joida, that ye Anabaptists are again overthrown, and that ye have taught that thing which ye could not prove by the scriptures, and yet for all that ye are so obstacle and stubborn that ye will in no wise give place unto the truth. Who would have believed thee to be so stiff-necked that I should be fain to drive thee to it with the scriptures? Simon, what make these things for the baptizing again? Joida, very much, for if the doctrine of John and the doctrine of Christ be all one, their baptism also is all one. Ergo, ye have no example at all of your rebaptization or baptizing again. Also they, whom mention is made of, Acts 19th chapter, could not have been baptized with the baptism of John, that is done in the water, and again be rebaptized by Paul, for so they should have been twice baptized with one baptism of water, and the one should have abolished the other, which thing cannot be done by no mean. For their baptism is all one. Simon, thou sayest right well, if there were only one baptism. Joida, ye do not only divide the church, but also baptism. I do bring against thee the words of Paul, which saith, Christ hath sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now I do ask thee, whether of these two is more excellent the doctrine of the gospel or the baptism. Simon, the doctrine is more excellent than baptism, for baptism is annexed and joined to the doctrine. Joida, if Christ and John do agree in the doctrine, it followeth that they did also consent and agree in the baptism. Ergo, their baptism is all one. Simon, it cannot be all one, for the apostles and Christ did baptize in the name of Jesus, also in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. John did not so, ergo, it cannot be all one baptism. Joida, Christ himself did not baptize, but his apostles in his name. John 3rd chapter. Whereas thou sayest, John did not baptize in the name Jesus, thou dost greatly err. For John 1st chapter, Mark 1st chapter, also Luke the 3rd chapter, it is most manifest and plain by his words that John did baptize in Jesus. For there he doth expound his baptism, saying, I do baptize with water, but he that shall come after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. What other thing is this, but that I do prepare you to Christ, which shall make you perfect? Is not this to baptize in the name of Jesus? In what, I pray thee, did the apostles baptize, but in the name of Jesus? Acts 2nd chapter. See now what thou hast won, truly none other thing, but that with thine own words thou hast confirmed and proved that their baptism is all one. Simon. Yet he did not baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Joida. Although John did not know Christ to be one God with the Father and the Holy Ghost, whereby it should follow that when John did baptize and send or direct men unto Jesus, that he did baptize and direct or send them unto a bare man, which thing, how ungodly it is, who doth not see? John Baptist did know Christ to be the Son of God, equal with the Father in all things. He knew also the Spirit of God did inhabit and dwell in him, which was given unto him after no measure, but of whose fullness all men did receive. John 1st chapter. For this cause he attributeth so much unto Christ, that he did send all men unto him, and prepare the people for him. Furthermore, he did baptize them in the name of Jesus, because that he knew him to be one God with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Simon, these be thy reasons, and not the word of God. Joida, I will prove thee these things by the word of God. When John did baptize Christ in Jordan, the heavens did open, and he did see the Spirit of God descending and coming down upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven saying, This is my well-beloved Son, in whom I am pleased. Who will say now that John knew not the Father and the Holy Ghost? John, second chapter. He doth celebrate and set forth with many goodly praises the majesty of Christ, among all other things, speaking after this manner, he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God doth not give him the Spirit after a measure. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. These things do testify and witness that John did know right well the mystery of the Trinity and unity in Christ. Simon I grant that he did know, as thou sayest, yet it followeth not thereby that John did baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Joida, it followeth plainly, for I do ask thee, whether he that baptizeth in Christ doth baptize in man or in God. Simon, in God, truly. 
Joida, now I ask whether Christ, touching his own God, had be separated from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Simon, no, for there is but one God only. Joida, now make thine argument after this manner. Christ Jesus, touching his divine nature, is not divided from the Father and the Holy Ghost. And he that baptizeth in Jesus baptizeth not in his human nature, but in his divine and godly nature. Ergo, he that baptizeth in Jesus baptizeth in the Father and the Holy Ghost. John, as it is proved before, did baptize in Jesus Christ, that is to say, in him that should come after him. Ergo, John did baptize in the Father and the Holy Ghost, for these sentences are of like signification and importance. He did baptize in God, he did baptize in Jesus Christ, he did baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, for there is one God only unto whom we are brought and grafted by baptism. Simon, I never understood this thing afore, for I thought that John had only begun with his baptism, but the baptism of Christ had then at length begun when he did send his apostles in the last chapter of Mark and of Matthew, which thing, if it were true, the baptism of John and the baptism of Christ could not be all one. Joida, of this did come and spring the error of the Anabaptists, because that they think that baptism was then ordained and instituted after that Christ did rise from death, and I do marvel that they did fall into this error, since that with plain testimonies of the scriptures it is set forth and expressed that Christ had by his apostles baptized before his death and afore that they had received the Holy Ghost, John 3rd and 4th chapter. After this Jesus did come and his disciples into the land of Jewry, and there he did abide with them and did baptize. John also did baptize before Christ, wherefore he was called Baptist. Simon, ergo baptism, hath his beginning and institution of man. Joida, truly, John was a man, which thing no man can deny, yet notwithstanding his doctrine and baptism were not of man, but of God. Matthew 1 and 20th chapter. But it is called the baptism of John and of the apostles, not because it is theirs, but because it is ministered by them. I will speak more plainly. Christ, Matthew 11th chapter, saith that the law and the prophets were till John came, whereby Christ doth show that the thing that the prophets did afore prophesy to be or to come was more fully set forth and declared by the preaching of John. For the things that afore by the prophets were prophesied to come under dark figures of words, the selfsame things are set forth by John as fulfilled and present, and are in a manner showed with the figure. The law had a mystical lamb, John did show the true lamb with his finger. John, therefore, doth begin first the gospel and the New Testament, and showeth that the Messiah is come. It was necessary, then, that he should abolish the old signs and change them into other, that should be without blood, worthy of the New Testament, for circumcision was changed into baptism. Therefore John beginneth baptism first as a sign or seal of the people of God. But let us hear his own witness and testimonies of that thing. Matthew, third chapter when he did see many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, that they also might receive baptism of him, he said unto them, Bring ye forth fruits worthy of repentance. By the which words John doth plainly declare, wherefore and for what purpose and use he did minister baptism, although he should say, It shall not be sufficient to have your body washed in the water, but rather this ye must have a respect unto, that ye be new men, that ye be sorry and repent of your misdeeds that are past, and take heed of them that are to come. There is no cause why ye should boast yourselves to be children of Abraham, unless ye do follow the faith of Abraham. What did Abraham? He did believe in God, he was obedient unto the word of God, he did approve himself, or showed himself faithful in all things unto the same God. For I say unto you, that God is able to raise unto Abraham children of these stones, that is to say, of the Gentiles, now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree wherewith the unprofitable branches that bring forth no fruit are cut off. That is to say, the boughs that did grow of the natural olive tree, I mean the unfaithful children being cut off and cast away from the testament of God, shall be destroyed and burnt. Understand therefore my words aright. Prepare your hearts against the coming of the Messiah, the new king. I do baptize you with water, and in a manner initiate you, or give you the first instruction in the religion of Christ to the intent that ye be such, that will repent and receive Christ. When he is received, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, that is to say, he shall seal and make you perfect with his Holy Spirit. He shall pardon and forgive you your sins. He shall also endue you with fire, that is to say, with fervent charity. Study with all diligence to receive him worthily, etc. 
By these testimonies we do conclude and gather that John did baptize first and that he did also baptize in Christ. The apostles, after that they had received Christ, did use none other baptism but the same that they had learned of John. Yea, Christ himself was also baptized in the baptism of John. If John's baptism is not true, it followeth that Christ was not truly baptized, and that he ought to be baptized again. Who is so mad to say so? Ergo, the baptism of John is the true baptism which Christ did confirm and sanctify in himself. Simon, I do agree unto all these things, but what do they make against rebaptization? Joida, this truly that the men of Ephesus, whom mention is made of, Acts the nineteenth chapter, were not baptized again, since that the baptism of Christ and the baptism of John be all one. If they were not baptized again, the Anabaptists have no example at all of their rebaptization, whereby it followeth that their rebaptization is not of God, for they divide that one only baptism. Paul saith, One God, one faith, one baptism, which is in the church of God, without the which there is no baptism. Since then, that the Anabaptists do forsake the church, Yea, do divide the church, and are fellows of heretics, they have no baptism. For they are not in the church of Christ, ergo, their rebaptization is repugnant unto God, and is nothing else but a new sect against the unity of the church. Simon, but thou dost dissemble this, that they do abhor the baptism of the bishop of Rome, none otherwise than in times past the holy fathers did abhor the baptism of heretics, or ministered by heretics. For they that had been baptized by heretics and schismatics were baptized again. Joida, who did ever baptize men with the baptism of the bishop of Rome? Did the bishop of Rome begin baptism? Simon, no, John began baptism, but the bishops of Rome did add many things of their own. Joida, the things that were added by the bishop of Rome, as salt, oil, conjurings, etc., are they baptism or part of baptism? Simon, neither of them, for then neither Christ nor John had baptized truly, which did not add these things. Joida, if these new added things are not baptism, nor yet part thereof, why do ye call it then the baptism of the bishop of Rome? Or was any man that did baptize in the name of Clement, Boniface, Leo, or Gregory? Simon, no man. Joida, in what then were ye baptized? Simon, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Joida, ergo, ye were not baptized in the baptism of the bishop of Rome, but in the baptism of God. And they that baptize you now, in what or with what words do they baptize you? Simon, with water, and in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Joida, were ye baptized in the same and with the same word in your youth? Simon, yes, truly. Joida, what needeth then this last baptism? Dost thou not see that ye are stark mad? Simon, when we were children, we knew nothing of baptism. We vow now unto God pureness and a life without sins. Joida, could ye not do this without baptism? If ye could, ye needed no water. If ye could not, the virtue is in the water. Ergo, our salvation is alligated and bound to the elements against the nature of faith and of the scriptures. What answer canst thou make here? Simon, it is better that we thus consecrate ourselves unto God. Joida, as monks did here before times bind themselves unto God with their vows, here poison is hidden, that ye do challenge and attribute unto yourselves pureness of life, ye do detest and abhor others as unclean, and as the Catharians in times past, ye do gather and assemble into yourselves a peculiar church, marking and sealing yourselves as though ye were the purest of all men. Wherefore, I may well call your rebaptization a new sect against the unity of the church, which thing appeareth more and more by this words. Tell me, I pray thee, if your church is without sins, or is no more in the flesh, where is then the lost and prodigal child, the straying sheep, the field sown with cockle and darnel, the net that draweth all kinds of fishes, the supper, or banquet, where all they that are bidden do sit also they that have not the bridegroom's livery? If ye be pure and whole, then have ye no need of Christ, the physician of the souls, O most bold and shameless hypocrites, O disguised and masked heretics, who hath bidden you to make division aforetime, or, if ye be so holy and pure, when will ye of charity bear with us our heavy burdens, wherewith we are overcharged and burdened, that ye may fulfill the law of Christ? When will ye have compassion of our infirmities? When will ye that are strong take us that are weak unto you? Why do ye cut off and condemn the sick and weak members? What are ye but schismatics?' 
Simon, thou hast not yet told why the ancient fathers did baptize them again that had been baptized by heretics. Joyada, they were not baptized again, but they were baptized as they that had been not baptized. For heretics did deny the Trinity, the Godhead of Christ and the Holy Ghost. Besides that, they were not of the church. Ergo, they had no baptism, nor did baptism in the name of Jesus, whom they did deny. Moreover, the custom of rebaptizing or baptizing again was not commonly used in the church. For they that had been baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost were not baptized again, but were received by the imposition of hands, and also were admonished to persist and abide in the sincerity of faith. This therefore helpeth you nothing, but rather doth make against you. Among the true Christians ye have no example at all of your rebaptization. But among these ancient heretics that have been already condemned of the church, for ye do renew the heresies of Apernatus, Novatus, and Pelagius. Simon, what manner of men were they? Joida, in the year of our Lord, 255, there rose in Rome a certain man called Novatus, a very arrogant, proud, obstinate, and bold man. He did teach that a man after baptism was pure and clean, which pureness, if he had once lost through sin, he could never be forgiven. And if any man for fear and dread or necessity of death had denied Christ, that he ought not any more to be received into the church, though he lamented never so sore for his fall, but that he ought to be separated and as a damned creature to be shunned of all men. This thing did cause a council of grave and holy men to be gathered at Rome, which by the scriptures, being truly understanded, did condemn this opinion as ungodly and heretical. Yet in the mean season Novatus doth not leave off, nor yet recant his ungodly opinion, but rather did assemble and gather a peculiar church, and condemning the churches, where sinners and repentant persons were, he did call his church pure. Therefore were the Novatians called Catharians, whom he did receive into his church, them did he bind unto his error, and consecrate unto his unpure cleanliness, by rebaptization or baptizing again. I do not bring these things out of mine own head, but out of those ancient doctors, Cornelius, Cyprian, Dionysius, Alexandrinus, and Eusebius, of whom some did live in Novatus' time. Now, if thou dost diligently look upon these ancient Novatians and the Anabaptists of our time, thou shalt find very little difference between them, for, as Novatus, being openly convinced in that most famous council of learned bishops, doth not forsake his error, but obstinately doth defend it, so the Anabaptists do at this present. For how often have they been overthrown in the open disputations that have been kept with them in Tigua, St. Gallum, Bern, Basel, Constance, Argentine, and August. And yet, for all that, they will rather lose their life than forsake their error, yea, they do gather and assemble peculiar churches, they baptize again, they condemn our churches as unclean, they do attribute unto themselves pureness of life. To be short, they do all things that Novatus did. In the mean season, they are ambitious, arrogant, proud, puffed up, and very hypocrites. Simon, I understand that the Anabaptists are Novatians. What sayest thou of the other two? Joida, Alpentius was the bishop of Milan for Ambrosius of the sect of Arius. He did condemn the baptism of children. His error was condemned in the council of Milvent. Simon, but it followeth not thereby that infants must be baptized. Joida, Verily it followeth, which thing we will now prove by and by. End of that rebaptization or baptizing again is not of God, and that there is but one baptism by Henry Bullinger. A letter of King Edward the Sixth to Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London, for the taking down of altars and setting up the table in the stead thereof by King Edward the Sixth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Right Reverend Father in God, right trusty and well-beloved, we greet you well. And where it is come to our knowledge that the altars within the most part of the churches of this realm, being already upon good and godly considerations taken down, there do yet remain altars standing in diverse other churches, by occasion whereof much variance and contention ariseth amongst sundry of our subjects, which, if good foresight were not had, might perchance engender great hurt and inconvenience. 
we let you wit that, minding to have all occasion of contention taken away, which many times groweth by those and such like diversities, and considering that amongst other things belonging to our royal office and care, we do account the greatest to be to maintain the common quiet of our realm. We have thought good by the advice of our council to require you, and nevertheless especially to charge and command you for the avoiding of all matters of further contention and strife, about the standing or taking away of the said altars, to give substantial order throughout all your diocese, that with all diligence all the altars in every church or chapel, as well in places exempted as not exempted within your said diocese, be taken down, and in the stead thereof a table to be set up in some convenient part of the cancel within every such church or chapel, to serve for the ministration of the blessed communion, and to the intent the same may be done without offence of such our loving subjects, as be not yet so well persuaded in that behalf as we would wish. We send unto you herewith certain considerations gathered and collected, that make for the purpose the which and such others as you shall think meet to be set forth, to persuade the weak to embrace our proceedings in this part, we pray you cause to be declared to the people by some discreet preachers in such places as you shall think meet before the taking down of the said altars, so as both the weak consciences of others may be instructed and satisfied as much as may be, and this our pleasure the more quietly executed, for the better doing whereof we require you to open the foresaid considerations in that our cathedral church in your own person if you conveniently may, or otherwise by your chancellor, or some other grave preacher, both there and in such other market towns and most notable places of your diocese, as you may think most requisite. Given under our signet, at our palace, at Westminster, the 24th day of November, in the fourth year of our reign, Edward Somerset, Thomas Cranmer, William Wiltshire, John Warwick, John Bedford, William North, Edward Clinton, Henry Wentworth, Thomas Eli. End of a letter of King Edward the Sixth to Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London, for the taking down of altars and setting up the table in the stead thereof, by King Edward the Sixth. Of the Lord's Supper, by John Knox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First, we confess that it is a holy action ordained of God, in the which the Lord Jesus, by earthly and visible things set before us, lifts us up unto heavenly and invisible things, and that when he had prepared his spiritual banquet, he witnessed that he himself was the lively bread wherewith our souls are fed unto everlasting life, and therefore in setting forth bread and wine to eat and drink, he confirms and seals up to us his promise and communion, that is, that we shall be partakers with him in his kingdom. And he represents unto us and makes plain to our senses his heavenly gifts, and also gives unto us himself to be received with faith, and not with mouth, nor yet by transfusion of substance, but so through the virtue of the Holy Ghost, that we, being fed with his flesh and refreshed with his blood, may be renewed both unto true godliness and to immortality. And also that herewith the Lord Jesus gathered us unto one visible body, so that we are members one of another, and make altogether one body, whereof Jesus Christ is the only head. And finally, that by the same sacrament the Lord calls us to the remembrance of his death and passion, to stir up our hearts to praise his most holy name. Furthermore, we acknowledge that this sacrament ought to be come unto reverently, considering there is exhibited and given a testimony of the wonderful society and knitting together of the Lord Jesus and of the receivers, and also that there is included and contained in this sacrament that he will preserve his church. For herein we are commanded to show the Lord's death until he come. Also, we believe that it is a confession wherein we show what kind of doctrine we profess and what congregation we join ourselves unto, and likewise that it is a bond of mutual love amongst us. And finally, we believe that all the comers unto this holy supper must bring with them their conversion unto the Lord by unfeigned repentance in faith, and in this sacrament receive the seals and confirmation of their faith, and yet must in no wise think that for this work's sake their sins are forgiven. And as concerning these words, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, 
on which the papists depend so much, saying that we must needs believe that the bread and wine are transubstantiated unto Christ's body and blood. We declare that it is no article of our faith which can save us, nor unto which we are bound upon pain of eternal damnation. For if we should believe that Christ's real natural body, both flesh and blood, were naturally in the bread and wine, that should not save us, seeing many believe that, and yet receive it to their damnation. For it is not his presence in the bread that can save us, but his presence in our hearts through faith in his blood, which hath washed out our sins and pacified his Father's wrath towards us. And again, if we do not believe his bodily presence in the bread and wine, that shall not damn us, but the absence out of our hearts through unbelief. Now, if they would here object that, though it be truth that the absence out of the bread could not damn us, yet are we bound to believe it because of God's word, saying, This is my body, which whoso believeth not, as much as in him lieth, maketh God a liar. And therefore an obstinate mind not to believe his word may be our damnation. To this we answer that we believe God's word and confess that it is true, but not so to be understood as the papists grossly affirm. For in the sacrament we receive Jesus Christ spiritually, as did the fathers of the Old Testament, according to St. Paul's saying, And if men would well weigh how that Christ, ordaining his holy sacrament of his body and blood, spake these words sacramentally, doubtless they would never so grossly and foolishly understand them, contrary to all the scriptures and to the exposition of Augustine, Jerome, Fulgentius, Virgilius, Origen, and many other godly writers. End of Of the Lord's Supper by John Knox His Confession Respecting the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper by John Wycliffe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We believe, as Christ and his apostles have taught us, that the sacrament of the altar, white and round, and like to our bread or host unsacred, is very God's body in form of bread, and if it be broken in three parts, as the church uses, or else in a thousand, every one of these parts is the same God's body. And right so, as the person of Christ is very God and very man, very Godhead and very manhead, right so, as Holy Church many hundred winters has trod, footnote, believed, end footnote, the same sacrament is very God's body and very bread, as it is form of God's body and form of bread, as Christ and his apostles teach. And therefore, St. Paul never nameth it, but when he calls it bread, and he, by our belief, took his knowledge of God in this, and the argument of heretics against this sentence, it is easy for a Christian man to resolve, footnote, refute, end footnote, and write as it is heresy to believe that Christ is a spirit and no body, so it is heresy to trow that this sacrament is God's body and no bread, for it is both together. But the most heresy that God suffered to come to his church is to trow that this sacrament is an accident without a substance, and may on no wise be God's body. For Christ said by witness of John that this bread is my body. And if they say that by this skill, footnote, interpretation, end footnote, holy church hath been in heresy many hundred winters, sooth, footnote, truth, end footnote, it is, especially since the fiend was loosed, that was by witness of angel to John Evangelist, after a thousand winters that Christ was stained, footnote, ascended, end footnote, to heaven. But it is to be supposed that many saints that die in the meantime before their death were pured of this error. Our great diversity is between us that trow that this sacrament is very bred in its kind, and between heretics that tell us it is an accident without a subject. For before that fiend, the father of leasing, footnote, lies, end footnote, was loosed, this gabbing, footnote, idle prating, end footnote, was never contrived, and how great diversity is between us that trow that this sacrament is very bred in its kind, and sacramentally God's body, and between heretics that trow and tell us that this sacrament may on no wise be God's body. For I dare surely say that if this were sooth, Christ and his saints died heretics, and the more part of holy church now believeth heresy, and before devout men suppose that this council of friars in London, which was with the Heridine, footnote, earthquake, end footnote, for they put a heresy upon Christ and saints in heaven, wherefore the earth trembled, they, footnote, in truth, 
landsman's voice answered for God, also it did in time of his passion when he was condemned to bodily death, Christ and his mother, that in ground hath destroyed all heresies, keep his church in right belief of this sacrament, and move the king and his realm to ask sharply of his clerks this office, that all his possessioners, footnote, ecclesiastics allowed to hold lands, end footnote, on pain of losing all their temporalities, tell the king and his realm with sufficient grounding what is this sacrament. And all the orders of friars, on pain of their allegiance, tell the king and his realm with good grounding what is the sacrament. For I am certain of the third part of the clergy that defend these doubts, footnote, disputes, that is here said, that they will defend it on pain of their lives. End of his confession respecting the sacrament of the Lord's Supper by John Wycliffe. Extract from the Testament of John Knox by John Knox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Extract from the Testament of John Knox made about six months previously to his decease. Lord Jesus, I commend my troubled spirit unto thy protection and defense, and thy troubled church to thy mercy, because I have had to do with diverse persons of the ministry, whereunto God of his mercy erected me within this realm. My duty craves that I should now leave unto them a testimony of my mind. And first unto the papists and to the unthoughtful world I say, that although my life has been odious to them, and oftentimes they have sought my destruction and the destruction of the church, which God of his mercy has planted within this realm, and has always preserved and kept the same from their cruel enterprises, yet to them I am compelled to say that unless they speedily repent, my departing this life shall be to them the greatest calamity that ever yet has taken hold upon them. Some small appearance they may yet have in my life if they have grace to see. A dead man have I been almost these two years last past, and yet I would that they should fully consider what better state they and their affairs stand in than has been before, and they have heard long time threatened. But if they will not admit me for an admonisher, I give them over to the judgment of him who knows the hearts of all, and will disclose the secrets thereof in due times. And thus far as to the papists... To the faithful God before his Son, Jesus Christ, and before his holy angels, I protest that God by my mouth, be I never so abject, has shown to you his truth in all simplicity. None have I corrupted, none have I defrauded, merchandise have I not made, to God's glory I write, of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, but according to the measure of the grace granted unto me, I have divided the sermon of truth in just parts, beating down the pride of the proud in all that did declare their rebellion against God, according as God in his law gives to me that testimony, and raising up the consciences troubled with the knowledge of their own sins by the declaring of Jesus Christ, the strength of his death, and the mighty operation of his resurrection. In the hearts of the faithful, I say, I have a testimony of this at this day in my conscience before God, howsoever the world rage. Be constant, therefore, in the doctrine that ye once publicly have professed, let not slanderous days draw you away from Jesus Christ, neither let the prosperity of the wicked move you to follow it or them. For however God appears to neglect his own for a season, yet he remains a just judge who neither can nor will justify the wicked. I am not ignorant that many would that I should enter into particular determination of the present troubles, to whom I plainly and simply answer that as I never exceeded the bounds of God's scriptures, so will I not now do by God's grace. I know on my death the rumors shall be strange, but beloved in the Lord, be he not troubled above measure. But yet again I say, remain constant in the truth, and he who of his mercy sent me, conducted me, and prospered the work in my hand against Satan, will provide for you abundantly when either my blood shall water the doctrine taught by me, or he of his mercy otherwise provide to put an end to this my battle. End of Extract from the Testament of John Knox by John Knox The History of the Death of John Uculumpadius, set forth by Simon Grineus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Simon Grineus wisheth long health to his friend Wolfgangus 
Faber Capito. I understand by your letters that many, as well in France as in other places, have written unto you the horrible brute flown in to foreign countries of the departure of our good friend John Ucolampadius, a man of much innocency, as though he had destroyed himself or his friends secretly made him away, and that this rumor is authorized by certain books published, so that many far distant hence persuade this to be no fable, and thereupon you earnestly require me, yea, truly me, that have... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Present in all these affairs, observed the sequel thereof, more circumspectly than other, upsucked his last sights, and closed my friend's eyes. In consideration of our mutual acquaintance long time confirmed, I would greatly the deceased with relation of the truth, removing all suspicion from the virtuous and godly and confounding the sycophancy and slander of the perverse and malicious rabble, in sort that the utility which the wise and learned have reaped of his monuments continually may increase in thee and his excellent works be purged of the sacrilegious accusations of the malignant. Albeit, my dear friend Capito, thanks be given to God, I never yet rested to defend truth with a singular zeal and to confute these monstrous lies which ever more trouble my mind. Yet for that, and see ordinarily this evil accident to the godly, that in their lifetime they be disdained of evil persons, and after their decease, here there is a lacuna in the text, to the devils. I thought it good to pass in silence the clamour of the adversaries, fearing some would conceive this were done of bravery and vain ostentation, rather than of any impelling need. If we trusted ourselves so slenderly in the defence of the good renown of a man exquisite and absolute in many notable areas, but all things deeply perpended, I could never be induced to write anything of the life or death of him whom we know well to have lived and died most holily albeit certain urged me to this attempt, the which in my judgment is notorious enough by his books, unless the venomous tongues of current detractors in most detestable manner had compelled me to do the same. And what shall I say, my dear friend Cabido, what this meaneth, or how it happeneth, that a thing deliberately and with leisure done in a famous and large city, in the face and audience of a great number, can breed any doubt, much less be taken in contrary part by his adversaries, so as he who finished his mortal life most blessedly and was lamented of all good persons should be defamed to have been murdered a horrible matter, and that he which was all his lifetime of a meek and gentle nature should be reported, here there is a lacuna in the text, information of impudent asses, here there is a lacuna in the text, cruel and bloody hand to have pulled out the wretched and miserable ghost. Can there be any so senseless, so infamous, so malevolent, to impair the good renown of an other, or, with violent interruption, to invade a silly dead carcass? But such is the order of destiny and course of human affairs. Certainly the clear sun of righteousness never riseth charged with dark clouds, but a... Here there is a lacuna in the text. Tempest, storm, and hurl wind follow, menacing the members of Christ a thousand calamities and deaths. Furious wrath and cankered malice spread their force, and impudent slanders reign in every place. But, as it is our part to endure and despise these evils, with an invincible courage and heart prepared to the cross of Christ, and disposed to patience, so it behoveth us not to dissimul a lie against the honour of God, nor quail to clear the truth. We therefore, that were present in these affairs, answer compendiously and faithfully the truth, touching the departure of this godly man, as well to refute the detraction of the sycophants, as to satisfy the desire of the honest, and bear witness of his innocency, as reason moveth us. A year before his decease he was more afflicted with sickness than all his lifetime past, and notwithstanding he was never impeshed with weightier affairs than at that instant, for the botch, which a little before was stopped, then began to break out, and overrunning inwardly his whole body, marvellously weakened his forces, attenuated and exhausted with watching. This while he was moved with an incredible solicitude, not only to see the gospel, which now began to flourish, prosper under him, but also in the broil of civil war, then fiery hot, and among sects budding and springing one from another, laboriously to do his duty and serve his call. Wherefore, having no respect of the troublous season, he watched and travailed much more than he ever did, going on foot through the whole circuit of his church, exhorting his own flock as well as his enemies, and oftentimes grievously and sharply rebuking them, not without great peril of his life, to reduce them to the right way. Briefly he employed himself in all things most faithfully, diligently, and with an ardent zeal. 
Furthermore, among so many public and particular affairs, among his ordinary sermons he began the Bible, which he was accustomed to read, when his turn was with another professor of divinity, and prosecuting daily the exposition of the same, as a true and singular bishop of Christ, he made an excellent work, bringing to light new and old matters, faithfully and learnedly, through his great knowledge of holy scriptures and the Greek and Hebrew tongues. This man alone sustained many burdens, one whole year together, marvellously patiently, with his tedious sickness, when the same inwardly flowed in his members with no less pain than when it brake out. Besides this, he enterprised the interpretation of two strange tongues. I need not to write with what dexterity. For diverse works of Theophylact, Cyril, and Chrysostom in that behalf bear lucent testimony, although it is apparent they were hastened too timely to the printer's press. He added here unto the expositions of those places which are most difficult and removed from common sense in the sacred scripture, as his large and learned commentaries upon Isaiah, Jeremiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Daniel, Job, Ezekiel, the epistle to the Romans and the Hebrews, the gospel of St. John, and his canonical epistles, the which he achieved not only before, evidently declare. And this while he ceased not to preach, I willingly pass over his particular affairs and an infinite number of answers he gave daily to the churches. I have wondered at his intolerable travails, and privily stealing on him I would gently rebuke him, saying he could not live long, and persuaded him to repose and spare himself till time of necessity. But his fatal day at hand he hastened and perfected all, as one that certainly knew his dying date was not far off. Even at this present Switzerland broiled with civil and lamentable war, Zwinglius, the valiant champion and deliverer of papistical thraldom among his, and diligent reformer of the evangelical purity, was cruelly slain in battle. There was also a treaty of peace made to the great discomfort and heaviness of such as unfeignedly feared God. These doleful and miserable mishaps abase the courages of all men, when either through pestilent air wherewith the city and his house was infected, or through the scab which corrupted and putrefied his inward parts, there appeared a botch upon his hucklebone, where all the bones assembled, and immediately after inflamed his body with a most vehement heat, no doubt it was a carbuncle. His colour was pale and earthy, and as hot as fire, and notwithstanding all these common and private diseases, he omitted not to preach, write, and read lectures, but, as a worthy soldier, hardened and patient in his pains, abandoned not his standing until the violence of his malady enforces him to keep home and rest on his bed, setting all business aside. We that were his friends reasoned and conferred with the physician, then after with the chirurgian, as well of the nature as regiment of his sickness, and even then the physician gave us faint hope of his recovery, partly considering the nature of his disease and partly the weakness of his body. But when he had considered all things, he wrought the best and readiest help for his redress. A day or two after, his heat began meanly to assuage by art and order of the physician, and the botch being ripened, ministered ease for the vehement heat to respire, so that now we began to hope of his health. And... Albeit he took in good part the travail and service of his friends, yet he praised them not to take so great pains, for that he was assured he should not escape this sickness. And this while his friends of all estates and the godly and grave counsellors of the city visited him, offering to gratify and declare their faithful and loving hearts towards him. It was also by decree of the Senate ordained that the physicians should employ their whole knowledge and endeavour to entreat him well. You should have seen such confluence of brethren and devout persons to visit, comfort, and watch with him, that where many before frequented his house, now a whole world seemed to occupy the same. His malady still continued at one stay, the eight day passed, the physicians agreed not in their consultations, although alike they did their duties as friends in all diligency and fidelity. They essayed all remedies, but this raging sickness overcame all their medicines, notwithstanding that the chief ordinary physician of the city confessed that the sickness so long rooted and grounded in him overcame not so much as the weakness of his body, which of long time had lost all strength. For the botch ran not as it was wont, but retired inward, and yet his sickness decreased nothing. Albeit his heat was temperate, but augmented in his bowels and with grievous pain of his head. Then the physician that had special charge of him resisted with all force and new medicines his sickness, and concealed no part of his industry and cunning towards his patient. Forthwith his strength began to return, and we almost persuaded of his recovery, for it appeared visibly that nature warred stronger in him, and suddenly, besides all expectation, the pain raged along his right side and apostumed with great quantity of flame, 
gathered in his bowels and flowing in abundance, but, as it appeared since, it was the last conflict nature had. For by and by his heart began to tremble, his eyes to settle in his head, his members to fail by force and violence of his sickness. Then the physician began to doubt, and we despair of his recovery. But he, the long past, was prepared to this blanket, and with deep sighs groaned for the same, forced not for our consolations, but with an invincible courage bade us be of good comfort. Then calling to him the ministers of the gospel, his companions in profession, with the principal of the church, he made the this oration. Ye see, brethren, in what state mine affairs rest. The Lord approacheth to call me hence. I am therefore desirous to confirm and establish my soul with the perfect joy of our Lord and consolation of you, my dear friends. What shall we, the servants of God, say in this fatal farewell? That jointly be coupled together in like love towards the Lord, like study, like care, and like doctrine. Salvation is procured for us. The faithful hope of God's kingdom by Christ is conquered for us. His doctrine is true. His light shineth even at our feet. Wherefore, abandon all sorrow, all dread of death, all error, and all doubt. What resteth then but constantly and faithfully to follow Jesus Christ, as we long since have begun? First, in purity of doctrine. Secondly, in life conformable to the lively word of God. Christ, pursuant enough, will of his infinite mercy give order for the rest and preserve his church. Endeavour then, with all alacrity of mind, my dear brethren, to make your light shine, so as God the Father may be glorified and the name of Christ resplendish, and have light by the brightness and integrity of your conversation. Love one another unfeignedly, having God ever more before your eyes. Men preach the truth in vain and little prevail words, for if we will subdue Satan, if we determine to shape this world after Christ, this specially that now is, we had need of a clear and holy life, of a heavenly courage and mind. See ye not what clouds appear, what tempest begins to noise, what alienation of minds, what impiety reign. Yet ye must be constant and courageous, assured the Lord will dispose all in just order. Oh, that I might be with you in your tribulations and expose this my life for the truth. But it may be so, for as much as the love of godly men and the band in Christ is indissoluble, and have all things in common among them. Such discourse had Ucolampadius concerning religion, generally with his brethren. And then he began to touch himself. Where I am slandered, saith he, that perversely I have corrupted the truth, I forth not, for praised be God. I depart to appear before the throne of Christ in pure conscience. There shall I truly know if I have seduced the church. I leave you witnesses of this mine opinion and attestation, the which I maintain and confirm in these my last sighs. And when he had said this, the brethren gave him their hands and faithfully promised to take care for the church. The morrow after, which was the, here there is a lacuna in the text, day he had laid sick, he commanded his children to be brought before him, and first he took them by the hand, then he stroked them on the head, and notwithstanding their tender years could not conceive the father's mind, for the eldest was but three years old. Go to the faith, he, Eusebi, you, Irena, and you, Aletheia, my dear children. Here there is a lacuna in the text. Ye God, your father. And when their mother had made a sign of grant, she would fulfill his commandment. He vended his eyes towards his wife, his mother-in-law, and other his. Here there is a lacuna in the text. Saying, I have with this my last restatement bound ye that ye end. Here there is a lacuna in the text. My children be such, as I said even now, and as I have ever desired, that is, fearing God, peaceable, meek, and true. And after all those that were present had given again consent and faithful promise to observe his request, he caused his children to be, here there is a lacuna in the text, from him. This was the last night, and all the brethren were with him, with whom it seemed, having, here there is a lacuna in the text, rest, he conferred very, here there is a lacuna in the text, a certain friend of his came in again that went forth, whom he required to, here there is a lacuna in the text, some news. The other answered, he knew none, but I will tell thee news, saith Ucolampadius. Every man was silent to hear what this might be. I shall be shortly, saith he, with Christ my Lord. Anon after, one demanded him, if the light hurted him not, and laying his hand on his stomach answered, here is light enough. The dawning of day appeared, and the sun began, with his radiant beams, to clear the whole world, when his fatal hour approached. His last prayer, which we could understand, and which he pronounced with great pain, yet easy to be understanded, 
was the 51st Psalm of David, which containeth David's penitent prayer for his sins, the which this godly man recited at large in the presence of us, with sighs drawn from his divine breast. This done, he paused a while, and as one suddenly awaked, said this prayer, Jesus Christ, save me. This was the last voice that issued out of that venerable mouth. We were ten brethren kneeling round about his bed, and lifting up our hands we made our prayer unto God. It was now clear and perfect day, and the sun ascended our horizon. When this holy man rendered his ghost to God his Creator, so meekly, humbly, and with such affiance in Christ his Lord, that all good people were no less comforted with his godly end than they had been edified by his virtuous life. Thus Ocolampadius ended his days, whose life shied in integrity and innocency. The cause recited in the beginning moved me, yea, truly me, that have been a lucent witness with diverse credible persons of all these things written, not to swerve from testification of the truth, but faithfully to advertise the same. And now, my dear friend Capito, since you have exhorted me to set forth his fatal end, reduce you to memory the order of his life. For you know what pleasure the godly shall receive, and what provocation this shall be for them to imitate his godly steps. I do not in vain require you to attempt this, for no man can more lively describe the same than you, with whom all his lifetime he had a great familiarity and learned conference. Then saying this ample occasion is offered unto you to satisfy the thirsty expectation of the godly and gratify the greedy desires of all honest and virtuous people, I doubt not, and the rather at the contemplation of my request, you will publish to the whole world the great abundance of grace it pleased the Lord to pour in this man, who is worthy to be calendared in the catalogue of famous and godly pillars of the Christian church. Farewell. End of The History of the Death of John Ocolampadios, set forth by Simon Grineus.